Hello, my name is Shane Dunn. I'm printing, uh, presenting on the urinary, my urinary presentation for my 5510 class, 520 class. If you're one of my students here, um, this presentation may be helpful to you if you're in bio, if you're one of my bio uh, 210 or 220 students. So first off, here's just the general anatomy of kidney. Now, while this, a lot of this PowerPoint is just, be, uh, just straight up pictures because I find the easiest way is using pictures to understand the concept of the kidney. So just listen to the words I say and you should be able to help kind of follow along. So uh, when most people think of the kidney, they think of this structure right here, which is the kidney. However, the functional part of the kidney is called the nephron, which is going to be this part. So most of this presentation is talking and spent on the nephron kidney. Now, the function of the kidneys are more than most people think. Most people think the kidney's main function is just to re remove body waste, which is one of it is one of its key functions. However, it also helps maintain fluid in the body, such as water. It also helps keep electrolytes balances, sodium, potassium, glucose, and such. And it actually helps release a lot of hormones. Uh, we're going to cover two hormones here that can help control blood pressure, but the kidneys can also uh, create a hormone that helps make blood. So the kidney is a, a very, very vital function. So let's move on to the next slide here. So this right here is an example of the kidney and the granulos and the Bowman capsule. So the kidney, if you look back, oops, look back here, there are some blood vessels coming in on the kidney. Right here, oops, not, sorry, it is not working real quick. I will use a zoom function instead. So you see some blood vessels enter the kidney. Now red blood, as you know, in most diagrams is going to be carrying oxygenated blood uh, and the veins as well. So when the blood is flowing into the kidneys, it's usually carried by arterioles, which are small blood vessels. Uh, they come to the kidney to remove any waste products they may have kept and to give the kidney some blood of itself. We're going to be talking about two specific, one specific arterial that kind of moves around. So if you look very carefully, sorry about that, very carefully, this right here is one arterial. It enters, and I want to use it in green right here, it enters this kind of weird looking Pac-Man mouth, which is called the Bowman's capsule, and it kind of swiggles around a lot right here. It kind of goes backwards and forwards, has a lot of weird moving parts, and then it leaves. So the diagram I'm going to show you is just a close-up version of that. Sorry about that. Here we go. Now we actually have this slide right here. So, right on. So this right here is an example of the uh, arteries, the Bowman capsule, and the grammarulus. So some words you're going to need to know is right here is the afferent arterial. Just how we do with neurons, afferent means arriving, hint, hint. The A stands for arriving. And the efferent means exiting. So the blood is entering in the afferent arterial and it is leaving in the efferent arterial. So when the blood enters, it, has, it, it doesn't immediately just leave, it kind of gets moves around a lot like a Marylist. This picture kind of moves it away because it wants to show more of the aspects of the Bowman capsule. The Bowman capsule has a lot of interesting things. There's lots of these little tunnel-like systems here, right here, like that, and basement membranes and other cells that are meant there, so when proteins and stuff like that is pushed in, bigger cells can't leave. For example, red blood cells should not be entering the Bowman's capsule. The things that should be entering are small molecules, such as sodium, potassium, uh, glucose, unfortunately does get through in, we'll talk about that in a little bit, it's bad, and um, other such things. Bigger molecules, uh, such as red blood cells, proteins and such, should not be going through being pulled through. And you can see this because these bigger holes will let these big holes right here, I'll, I'll show in kind of a green color because red's being used a lot. This green color right here, these bigger holes let bigger proteins through. And then these smaller holes in between these things stop it. So it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So only the smallest molecules and liquids should be moving through. So how does all this stuff get pushed through? Well, we have the granulose infiltration rate. So basically what happens is the blood that is being pushed into the afferent arterial is being pushed in the heart. So it has a lot of pressure being pushed into it. And we consider that the hydrostatic force of the afferent arterial. So that's going to force a lot of the blood, not really blood, but a lot of the fluid and stuff inside 
of the blood to be pushed into the Bowman's capsule space, which all these dark arrows you see. Well, because there's fluid in there, it itself has a hydrostatic force. And the hydrostatic force of the capsule pressure, the Bowman's capsule pressure, is 15. And you see those light blue arrows. So they kind of push against it. Now, it's not, it's not strong enough to overcome it, but it is enough to weaken it down a little bit. And the bigger one now is this blood osmotic pressure. Because a lot of the plasma proteins, such as albumin and stuff like that, stick inside the blood, it's going to pull some of the liquid and some of the salt back into it. So there we go. However, both of the hydrostatic and osmotic blood pressures cannot counteract the 55. 15 plus 30 is 45. So when you have 55 minus 45, you're left with 10. So the net filtration is 10. So fluid is, the net filtration means 10, per, 10 uh, milligrams of mercury or 10 milligrams of mercury pressure of fluid is pushed further into the kidney, into the nephron. Now, a lot of these things can change depending on conditions. So say, for example, we want to increase net filtration. Well, what we could do is we could technically vasoconstrict or make the blood vessel for the efferent, the one leaving, smaller, which means less blood is leaving, which means more blood is being built up. This, in theory, would increase intramuscular pressure, which would cause the um, hydrostatic pressure to increase from, like, for example, like to 65 or even 75, which would increase the net by the same amount. We could also vasodilate afferent arterioles to increase pressure as well, and this would be the exact same thing. More blood's coming in, which means the hydrostatic pressure is better. If we want to decrease pressure for some reason, so say for, for some reason we're filtering too much, we can vasoconstrict the afferent, make this smaller, which will limit the amount, which would stop the amount, of, limit the amount of blood entering, and we can dilate the efferent, make this bigger, letting more blood leave, which should lower net filtration. But that's how you can kind of control filtration. Now, my favorite part of the kidney is the nephron itself. So we just saw the blood enter or pass through the glomerular capsule. And the first part right here, I'll show in red, is called the proximal distant, uh, proximal convoluted tubers, tubes. And it got convoluted because it's a weird, these weird looking shaped tubes, like a noodle, right? Right here on this purple, we have this loop of Henle. And back here, we have the distal. And lastly, we have the collecting, the collecting duct. <clears throat> so the proximal's main job is to catch any immediate red flags that should not be there. For example, the biggest ones it needs to uh, find and collect is glucose. Glucose should not be in urine. An example of glucose in urine is diabetes. Now, if you're diabetic, which means you're going to have uh, a lot of conditions of diabetes, but diabetes means you're having urine in your uh, in your urine, glucose in your urine, by med, which is very, very bad. So what we're going to do is we're going to absorb as much glucose as possible. Now, we want to absorb 100 amount of glucose as possible because we don't want any wasted glucose. We also will absorb a lot of vit uh, amino acids, proteins, um, uh, vitamins, and such. We'll absorb a little bit of other stuff here too, but mainly it's going to be the big things we need. Now, the cool thing, a little bit right here, is the loop of Henle. This is my favorite part of the nephron. So the loop of Henle actually is this very, very long loop. Some are very long, some are not. And a lot of this is not happening in the medulla or the meat of the kidney, all right? But some parts go, some of the loop Henle's go very, very deep inside of the kidney. It's a medulla. It's kind of cool as the, as the fluid is kind of moved through here, what happens is the medulla, right here, medulla, I'm writing with a pen, so I apologize, is very salty. So very salty. And when you have when you eat a lot of like crackers, like salty crackers, you want lots of water. Same thing happens here. So a lot of the water that is reabsorbed happens in the descending loop when it goes down. A lot of water goes in. And anytime water leaves uh, um, the nephron, the urea, is pushed into it. So when water leaves, your urea, urea is pushed in. There you go. 
And the reason why medulla is so salty is because we have this pump and we actually use some energy for it. And we push out a lot of sodium and a lot of potassium and chlorine. So we push out sodium chloride, which is just salt. So we, we waste energy to push out salt, which is a pretty big thing because our body likes to, uh, likes to absorb, a lot of, we absorb a lot of things. Um, one moment, someone is calling me. One moment. Okay, hello, well, welcome back. Sorry about that, my headphones dotted me. I wanna make sure you guys can hear me. So we push out a lot of sodium and chlorine and that just makes the medulla very salty. This is called the countercurrent because we are keep, we keep on pushing out and wasting energy, pushing out sodium and, uh, sodium and chlorine, making salt, to reabsorb a lot of water. That's why it's kind of countercurrent because one causes the other one to go, so this, it keeps on going and going and going. The distal convoluted tubes, the very ones right here, basically is our last attempt to absorb anything else before anything else occurs. And this is where we actually reabsorb a lot of our sodium. We use sodium, we use sodium a lot in our body. So anytime we reabsorb sodium, right, we have to replace it with we have to replace it with something equivalent. The equivalent would be potassium, right? So we actually pee out a lot of potassium and keep a lot of sodium in our body uh, because sodium is used for a lot of extra uh, functions and such. Well, potassium is less used in the body. So we actually pee out a lot more. We pee, we pee out a lot more. The, con the collecting ducts is the absolute, 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 absolute. It's like trying to wring out as much water as possible. So we try, we try reabsorbing some water. And we actually were absorbing areas too, because yeah, it goes there. There you go. That's pretty much the process of that occurring. So let's talk about some hormones. So the very first one we want to talk about is AVP. You might also heard that as antidiuretic, ADH. Antidiuretic or vasopressin is a hormone that is made in the hypothalamus, in the posterior side of the hypothalamus. And it affects multiple organs. Like for example, when AD, uh, vasopressin or AVP or what, um, goes to the liver, it's going to do glycolysis and other stuff. But we don't really care about the kidney. So what's it going to do in the kidney? Well, ADH means antidiuretic hormone, which means we're going to stop peeing. So if we stop peeing, what happens? Well, let's go back to our previous diagram. Go back to the previous diagram. So we're not peeing anymore, right? So less fluid is coming out. The fluid is not going out as much, which means we're going to reabsorb a lot more water. So water retention requires much, much more. So we increase our water reabsorption by a lot. Now this means a lot more water re-enters our blood. And doing this, right, means our blood is, has more liquid inside of it, which would increase blood pressure, right? Kind of think about uh, putting more water into a hose. It's going to increase the amount of water being pushed through or the force of the water being pushed through. So vasopressin is going to increase blood pressure while antidiuretic would decrease, uh, make you stop peeing to make you retain more water to make you pee. Another important hormone is called, uh, um, the, well, it's called the renin angiotensin cycle. Uh, what occurs is the uh, um, liver makes angiotensinogen the kidney will release renin. These will combine together to make angiotensin one. This will then go to the lungs to make ACE, which is angiotensin converting hormone, which converts angiotensin, angiotensin two, which then gets put into the adrenals, which then helps make aldosterone, right? And this cycle usually occurs because we have a decrease in blood pressure. So say for example, something causes us to have a decrease in blood pressure. Oh no. Uh, we lost some blood, we're super dehydrated, um, we're just not as active as we should be. Pressure happens and our body does this whole cycle. Now, this whole thing has to interact with the liver, the kidneys, the lungs, and then back to the kidneys. So we wanna have as much bang for our buck this cycle because it does a lot, right? So what's gonna happen is aldosterone has multiple target organs. To go to the heart, and then it's going to make the heart kind of beat faster to increase blood pressure. It's going to go to arterioles, right? And it's caused vasoconstriction, which makes them smaller, which is an increased blood pressure. And it's also going to go to the kidney, 
which is also gonna help us retain water, which is also gonna help us increase our blood pressure, which means we're going to retain more sodium. The very end part where I mentioned the sodium, sodium potassium kind of being moved around, right around here, are doing green. This part right here, it's going to increase the amount of sodium being reabsorbed, which is an increased amount of calcium being kicked out because sodium is a one aspect, as one half of salt, sodium chloride. So that means it's going to reabsorb a lot, a lot more water, which then in should increase blood pressure. And that is my slide. Thank you very much. Here's my references. I hope you guys have a wonderful time.